everyone. Welcome back to the Spirit of Success. I'm your host, Yara, and on today's episode, we will be discussing careers related to acting and entertainment. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with acclaimed and beloved actor, Mr. Rain Wilson. Mr. Wilson is an actor, writer, and producer who is best known for his role as Dwight True on the NBC sitcom, The Office. His other works include Smurfs, The Lost Village, Six Feet Under, Almost Famous, The Rocker, and Don't Tell a Soul. Among the various wonderful initiatives that he has helped create and been involved in, Mr. Wilson co-founded the digital media and entertainment company Soul Pancake, which works to promote and create uplifting art and entertainment, as well as the Lide Haiti Foundation, which is an educational initiative that works to empower at-risk girls and women in rural Haiti through the arts. Mr. Wilson also hosts and is a part of a variety of programs, including his own podcast called Baha'i Blogcast. Welcome, Mr. Wilson. How are you today? I'm okay. I'm good, Yara. Thanks for having me on your show. This is delightful. Thank you for being on the show today, and I'm super excited for our conversation. I am too. I'm so excited. So before we get into the details of your career, we would love to know what got you interested in acting and performing, and how did you get your start? Well, great question. Um... I, um, I always wanted to be an actor. I don't have a terribly exciting story around that. And um, I moved high schools to a high school from Seattle to a high school in Chicago. And they had a really great acting department. And, um, and then I found I was good at it. So I started uh, taking an acting class and I was just able to make people laugh just by goofing off and being myself. And I thought this is fantastic. And then I auditioned for some plays and I got some lead parts and I was like, oh, this is, this is great. I love this. I had a wonderful drama teacher and I remember going into her office and saying, uh, and I was so nervous and I really had fallen in love with acting. And I went to her and I said, Mrs. Adams, do you think it's possible that someday, you know, if I worked really hard and studied really hard that that I could be an actor. And she said, Oh, yes, you should try it. Absolutely. You should go, but you must study. You must read books. You must travel the world. You must fall in love. You must learn lots of different things, have lots of life experiences. But I, but yes, you have lots of talent and you should try it. Yes, absolutely. And, um, and I was just beaming. I was glowing. I was so excited uh, because I, um, uh, it was kind of beyond my wildest dreams, really, because where I came from in suburban Seattle, um, I didn't know anyone who was a professional actor. I didn't know any professional artists. My dad was a, a struggling artist and painter, and he tried to write some books and stuff like that, but not with much success. So I never knew anyone who really got paid to make art. So All my friends' dads were carpenters and fishermen and, you know, insurance salesmen and stuff like that. So I didn't know artists. I wasn't in the milieu of knowing artists. So this was kind of beyond my wildest dreams. And and I thought about how important that conversation was because it would have been really easy for the teacher to say to me, well, you know, it's a really hard road and very few make it and, you know, or to be like, well, why don't you keep working at it and check back in with me in a few years or something like that. But she was so supportive and, and uh, enthusiastic and, and loving that it really, it really helped me have a belief in myself. Well, that's wonderful. And it's always wonderful to have somebody who's encouraging us to do what we love, whatever that career is, and in your case, acting. So that's wonderful to hear. And thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so... You talked about how acting has been something that you've always wanted to do, that you've always loved, and the arts has been something that you've always loved. So from that, what does creativity mean to you? And how have your values and spirituality impacted and influenced your career and your approach to acting? Well, that's a great question, isn't it? <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> the um, Boy, we could have a whole long conversation about uh, creativity. It's um, It's a fascinating topic. I've always been really intrigued with it. Where does creativity come from? Yeah. You know, um, we're both members of the Baha'i faith. And one of the things we're asked as Baha'is is to 
develop spiritual qualities in ourselves. And these are the virtues that are manifested by God and by great spiritual teachers like Jesus and the Buddha and Baha'u'llah. And so um, God is the creator and there is something about um, being creative that is an emulation of a divine spark or divine spirit. I really view creativity and imagination and the arts as being part of um, being a, uh, a spiritual person. So, you know, here we are in this miraculous universe um, that, you know, 8 billion years ago wasn't here. Apparently there was just something smaller than a speck and, the, and it erupted in the Big Bang and produced all of matter and time and energy and galaxies and all the elements. And, uh, and that's God creating this incredible physical universe. And <clears throat> when we have a blank sheet of paper or a blank stage or a, an empty room that we sing in or a poetry that we write or a film that we make or acting that we do, we're emulating that that divine spark of creativity. And yeah. I really believe that the, um, the, the, the arts and, uh, and we're also taught in the Baha'i faith that the arts and worship go hand in hand. So the creating of Abdul Baha, the son of the founder of the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah says that, um, that uh, art is the same as being in the temple. Um, it's that art and devotion are the same in this day and age. So, um, but there's much more to say about creativity and imagination. Um, I love that kind of miraculous sense of like, there was nothing and then there was a song. There was nothing, then there was a poem. There was nothing, then there was a dance. There yeah. was nothing, then there was a character. And that that is something that is, truly inspiring to me through all the arts. And I love that, you know, examining that, that impulse. For sure. And that's such a wonderful way to think about creativity and what it means to be creative, both from the spiritual realm and from the everyday to day life. We're all creative in some way and how we manifest it. It's just it's such a cool thing. And so how have your values um, and your spirituality impacted and influenced your career as well as your approach to acting? I see them as being intertwined. You know, I left the Baha'i faith for a long time because I just didn't want anything to do with religion uh, when I was a young person. But then I found myself a few years later very, very unhappy. And after a deep search of, um, you know, studying lots of different religious faiths and spiritual traditions and trying meditation and prayer and going to a Buddhist temple and um, reading the Bible and I, I came back to the Baha'i faith and that's when I found that there was this kind of correlation between being an artist and being in worship. And the other thing that arts are is they're a form of service. So one of the great things about having played Dwight is that uh, people say, oh, I loved the show so much. Um, in my, my family was, my mom was sick or my sister was sick or my parents were getting a divorce or there was some bad time and watching the office and watch making Dwight making me laugh really helped me through some really difficult times. And I, and I didn't necessarily sign up for the office to say, oh, I'm going to go be of service, but it's really nice. You know, I wanted to play a funny role and be a part of a cool project and make some money and make a living and work with awesome people. Um, but Coming out of it, it's been really nice to see, oh, wow, we we positively impact, you know, hundreds of thousands of people that have really come away, not just as an entertainment, but it's it's helped them and, and soothed them and uplifted them. So I, I always think that every art has a service component yeah. to uplift, inspire, bring together, educate, uh, transport, beautify, um, uh, the the current situation. I love that. And, and that really does show the power that art has. And it's funny that you mentioned Dwight actually in that question, because my next question is more specifically, 
as we talked about, you're really well known for playing Dwight from The Office. So what inspired how you acted out his character and how did your own personal views, beliefs and values bring a unique perspective to how you portrayed Dwight? Well, um, so Dwight was based on a character from the English show. So I watched the English office and uh, um, uh, the, the, the gentleman, Mackenzie Cook, who played uh, Gareth in that show, he had a lot of really funny things that I basically got to steal. And I looked at playing Dwight as he played a certain role in the show. You know, he had to be the oddball. He had to be the authority. Sometimes he was a nerd. Sometimes he was a bully. He had all these different, he was a suck up. You know, he had all of these different aspects of who Dwight was. And as an actor, that's part of your job is to kind of go, you know, what role does my character play in the ensemble and in this larger story that I'm telling? So, you know, I had a very peculiar uh, upbringing in suburban Seattle. And, um, you know, I was really nerdy when I was a kid. I played Dungeons and Dragons and I was on the chess team and I played the bassoon <laughs> orchestra. And so I definitely related to the nerd part. And then he was a farmer and a lot of my relatives and ancestors were all farmers from Wisconsin and Minnesota. And I had some farmer relatives. And so I, I and, and he also like drives a muscle car and there's something very kind of like suburban about him. And mm -hmm. I was very suburban Seattle in the same way. So I, I related to a lot of that stuff. And um, so just brought, every time you're an actor, you bring your own unique history, yeah. your own unique story to bear in the character that you're playing. So a lot of my background kind of came out in various ways in Dwight. That is so cool to hear, you know, the process of what goes into making this character really your own character. Um, and shout out to all the orchestra kids, because I relate. I'm in orchestra. I'm also in marching band. So we love the nerdy orchestra kids. They're the best. Um, but as we mentioned a little earlier in the episode, you co-founded the entertainment company Soul Pancake, which serves to create uplifting and moving content and to make a positive impact via entertainment. Over the years, how have you seen the mission of Soul Pancake grow and evolve since its opening? And how do you think Soul Pancake shows the positive power that art and entertainment can have? Uh, well, great question. Yeah. So when I started to get well known for doing The Office, um, I realized that, oh, I had um, all of a sudden I had a large platform. You know, a lot of people were paying attention to me and going, you know, who's this guy? What does he have to say? And so I started talking with some friends about something, some, something we could do that had a positive impact um, on the world. And uh, we really saw that need on the internet and in digital media, especially. So we started Soul Pancake as a website uh, for as a place to discuss life's big questions. And we would post articles and content, and then people could discuss life's big questions among themselves on the website. Then uh, uh, that was fine, but it wasn't really going anywhere. And we kind of stalled out and we realized like, oh, we were making this visual content, uh, short form video and digital video and whatnot. And that was always the most successful stuff that we did. So we thought, okay, let's shift. We're going to focus. We're going to rebrand ourselves as a media content company rather than an internet portal. So the, the Soul Pancake website is nothing that special anymore. It used to be much more interactive and deep and complex. And so we just started making uh, content and that really took off. So I took off on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook and on social media, but we also made content for companies and for brands and for channels. We sold some TV shows along the way that we did based on Soul Pancake content, like the show Kid President, which was a big hit show for us. But guiding it all was, can we build a profitable media company that um, at the same time has a mission and that mission is to uplift and inspire and bring people together and get them talking about life's big ideas. And so we wanted to marry both of those things. Most production companies or digital companies, 
they just want to make money. They just want to survive and employ people. They don't have like a, a vision or a mission central to their essence, central to their core. But we did that with Soul Pancake and it was very successful. We have, you know, a billion video views later, you know, dozens and dozens of hit viral shows and videos. Um, we've been doing a really uh, a, a great job. And I think that speaking about art as service, this was undertaken like we want to serve and entertain at the same time. So it's kind of serve you attainment. Yeah, and, uh, it's been a it's been a long, crazy, uh, sometimes arduous road, but uh, we've had a lot of fun doing it. What, how amazing. And it, it's really, really needed in the entertainment world. I remember watching Kid President when I was younger at school, it would play. And it's just so cool to see something that has a positive impact, that makes people happy, that motivates them. Uh, but it's also serving to have let people have fun, let them see something fun, discuss big topics at the same time. It really meshes the two together so well. Hmm. From that, and kind of like we were talking about in this question and you were sharing with us, what do you think is the role of service in a career in entertainment? Well, I think the role of service has to be undertaken um, by anyone in any career that you undertake. Uh, this is a big problem today is people view service as like something you do on a weekend or I'm going to volunteer at the soup kitchen or I'm going to do something nice for someone and they don't see service as interwoven with their identity as a human being and their purpose on the earth. So whether you're an accountant or a carpenter or a school teacher or you know you work in government or aerospace or whatever, whatever it is that you do can be seen as service. So we're attempting to make the world a better place to bring people together. And even just providing for your family can be a service as well. So uh, it's, it's really important to see that. And I think people in the entertainment business, whether it's music or dance or theater or what have you, it's really important to um, uh, to view, uh, to look very cannily at like what it is that you're putting out into the world and what's the message that you're sending. Yeah. And I turn down a lot of stuff that is negative or um, kind of degrades people or kind of makes the world a worse place. I'm, I just don't want a part of that. Um, I want to you know, and I don't always succeed. Some of the content that I've done over the years has not always been like superlative, but as long as it doesn't make the world a worse place, um, that's really the most important thing. What a wonderful message. And I think that's a very important point. And it's one that we've discussed on the show. And it is the, is the goal of the show is that service is something that you put together in your life. It really is part of something that you do and part of who we are. It's not just the idea of going and volunteering and it's a separate part of your life, but really they are interconnected. Mm -hmm. So glad to hear that. Um, and also another important thing that you brought up is that I feel like a lot of people sometimes feel that in order to be successful, you have to jump on every single opportunity um, just to hopefully get your name out there. But really what I think comes first and what we've been talking about is that by putting your values and your morals first um, and really sticking with your mission, you are able to make a positive impact and hopefully become successful from that. And success, as we'll talk about um, in the upcoming question, is something that's different for everybody. So speaking of which, what does success mean to you and how has your definition of success evolved throughout your life and career? Well, that's a good, another good question. You're really hitting some some excellent, excellent, challenging questions. Good for you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so for me, success early on meant working as an actor and being able to pay my bills and not have to work another job. So early on, it was like, I would like, I wanna get paid for acting and I don't have to wanna wait tables and be a caterer and drive a moving van and work odd jobs to, to pay the bills. And that was for the first uh, 10 years of my life or so uh, as a professional actor. Um, so that's all success looked like is like, can I get an agent and get some auditions and get some work and, and just not be, you know, working in a restaurant. Um, 
And then I achieved that. And then success was like, well, if I ever want to buy a house, then I need to be on a TV show. So then it was more about like getting on a TV show. That's when, once I got on a TV show, it's like, oh, can I parlay this TV show into being in films and to kind of being a bigger name? Because a lot of people break from TV into films and become stars. Um, and that didn't quite work out for me. Um, I still get to do some really cool films and I've done some really awesome films that I'm proud of, but it didn't really break through in terms of like Rain Wilson, like film star. Um, <laughs> And that's okay. And and then I'm glad you said that because as my kind of spirituality has gotten deeper and my life story has gotten deeper, uh, it's uh, it's more that I view success as, well, my family is a success, my wife and my son, um, building a home for us. Uh, success is, you know, am I living a balanced life in harmony with God, with nature, with the divine with my family needs and my friends am i staying right sized as a human being and balanced as a human being this is much more of what success means today am i being of service to others am i helping other people um so my definition of success over the years has has changed quite a bit and matured quite a bit so you're you're great yara because you're young but you're starting out with uh, you, you're very spiritually wise at a very young age. So you're um, you're onto something great. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that, and thank you for sharing that evolution with us. Because I think it's kind of unrealistic for any of us to think that when we've come up with a definition of success, especially as youth, and we're looking into what we want to do in the future, and how we want to do it, and all of that, to think that definition of success that we have is going to stay forever. So it definitely is something that evolves. We kind of touched on this as well throughout the, the previous questions, but what impact do you think acting and entertainment should have on our society? And how does this view align or differ from the current impact of entertainment? Right. So, well, you, you talked about entertainment. So um, Hollywood comes under fire a lot for the stuff that it makes. But we live in a capitalist society and the stuff that it makes is bought by people. People watch it and then they're able to sell ads. So if someone doesn't like, uh, let's say, you know, drunk housewives of Dallas or whatever, and they think it's horrific and awful, well, then that's an indictment, not of the studio that's making drunk housewives of Dallas. That's an indictment of the millions and millions of people that every week tune in to watch Drunk Housewives of Dallas because you know, the entertainment companies are simply trying to make money um, because all companies, we live in a, just a, a sheer capitalist materialist society that doesn't take much into consideration other than the bottom line, other than profit margin, margins and what your quarterly reports are to the board. So um, Entertainment comes in lots of different forms. It can come in cartoons. It can come in uh, reality TV. Uh, it can just be kind of mindless distraction, or it can be deeper than that. Um, sometimes deeper stuff is good. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes deeper stuff is really degrading to the human condition and shows humanity at their worst kind of sexually and with violence and, um, um, how they relate to one another and doesn't offer any kind of path toward hope. Now that needs to be balanced with the fact that we are trying to tell stories from the real world. And there are a lot of hopeless stories out there. And there's a lot of dark, harsh truth about what it is to be alive in 2021 these days. So I, I don't know where I'm going with all this, but there's a lot of different ways to look at entertainment. So for me, the best entertainment is something that um, shines a mirror, shows a mirror, holds a mirror up to nature, holds a mirror up to society in a way, so we can kind of see something about society, that has characters that we love and we relate to, that there's something inspiring about it. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that everything has to be like a Disney show, like uplifting and loving and hugs and snowflakes and, and unicorns. That's not what I'm talking about. For me, some of the most uplifting stories there are 
are, are very dark stories, but they, are, they reveal something very human. And so I think that the best art and the best media kind of reveals something about the human condition, entertains us, and um, uh, kind of all at the same time. But there's, there's a lot of considerations to be making as you're trying to make, trying to make entertainment. Exactly. In order for something to be uplifting and to help the human condition, it doesn't mean that it has to be all happy and that it's only radiating the things that we consider to be positive. But really, it's saying that it's something that can be a reflection of what is going on in our society of the human condition, but does so with the purpose of helping us move forward. Can I just say one more thing on that? Mm, Good. I think that when I was a kid growing up, there was very much this idea that, hey, do whatever makes you happy. As long as you don't hurt anybody else, it's fine. And this really was fine for many decades or seemingly was fine for many decades. But we're at a place right now, humanity's at a very grave turning point, obviously with climate change and, and a lot of um, great peril ahead. And we need to do more than just have a good life as long as we don't hurt anybody else. That's, that's the minimum. That's the absolute minimum a human can do is to not hurt someone else. We, but we have to rethink this a little bit and think about how do we, um, uh, how do we actually improve other people? How can we do what we want to do, be content, be happy, and actually improve the lives of others? And if everyone focused that way, if you had 7 billion people saying, hey, I want to have a good life, I want to get an education, I want to work, I want to be a productive part of society, um, I'm not going to hurt any other people. And not only that, I'm also going to help other people through what I do. If you had 7 billion people with that mindset, then we would be able to kind of make the world a better place. Exactly. And that's a wonderful thinking point um, for the audience and for all of us to think about in whatever we're doing. It's about having an impact that really helps strengthen our world and helps us all come together. So in 2015, you co-founded Lide Haiti, which is an organization that aims to contribute to creating a world where girls have equal access to quality education, a sense of their own voices and their innate gifts, are resilient and feel empowered to use those strengths to achieve their educational goals, support one another, and to contribute positively to the betterment of their local and global communities. What inspired you to create this initiative alongside your wife, Holiday Reinhorn, and Dr. Catherine Adams? And can you share with us a little bit more about the work that your organization does? Sure. So I was on the board of another nonprofit called the Mona Foundation. And around 2009, we took a trip down to Haiti because they were working with four or five different educational initiatives in Haiti, the Mona Foundation raises money in the United States to support uh, up and coming uh, uh, schools and educational initiatives around the world. So we went to Haiti, we really fell in love with the country. It's obviously it was one of the poorest places in the world and it's staggering the poverty in Haiti. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's really mind blowing. I've been to some poor places before, I've traveled in El Salvador and Guatemala. And as a kid, I lived in Nicaragua and I've been to, you know, way out in the, in the desert in Morocco. And I've seen some poverty before, but Haiti's like, like nothing you've seen. And then, so we thought, oh, well, this is nice. We want to do some more stuff with Haiti. And this is a wonderful place. I love the people, the culture is so vibrant, the arts, um, the, the humor. It's a, it's a wonderful place. And, um, and then a month later, there was the earthquake. It was the great earthquake in 2010. And 300,000 people died in the matter of two, three minutes. It was absolutely devastating. One of the worst disasters in human history. And uh, we knew we needed to do something more. We had just been there. The hotel that we stayed at was completely wiped out. Everyone who was inside of it was killed, um, just as an example. So we had an opportunity to go back and do some arts teaching work with adolescent girls in this living in this tent camp. And I taught drama. My wife is a fiction writer, Holiday Reinhorn, and she writes stories and 
teaches creative writing. And so we taught the arts and we saw what an incredibly important and impactful uh, impact teaching the arts were to adolescent girls. Um, and along with Dr. Catherine Adams, who unfortunately just passed away a couple of months ago, uh, and she was really a doctor in with this area of specialty, uh, we launched Lide Haiti. And because uh, we knew we needed to do something more that we we were arts teachers, we saw the impact of arts, and we wanted to give back to the great country of Haiti. So uh, Dr. Adams moved moved to Haiti, we set up shop in northern Haiti. And right now we work with a, in about 11 locations with about seven or 800 girls. Uh, we have a staff of 40 Haitians. And uh, we do arts and literate, but also we added literacy. And we also do scholarships for the girls. Then we also do um, tutoring. Um, and we have a mobile computer lab as well. And then we've added, you know, we feed the girls when we're there. So we have a kind of a food program and then healthcare as well. So we have nurses on staff and a lot of the girls run into health problems that need to be taken care of and, and what have you. So um, uh, it, it does a lot and um, it's been a real honor and a pleasure to work on it. The, with COVID and with the current situation in Haiti, which is really bad, we haven't been able to be back to Haiti in like two years. So we support it remotely with an all Haitian staff. Um, but that's that's the story of Lide Haiti. What an amazing initiative. And um, Dr. Adams, may she rest in peace. It's amazing to hear the work that you guys are doing and the, the wonderful impact that it has. Um, so in this portion of the show, we kind of shift towards youth and talking about what youth can do. So what do you think is the role of youth in today's society? Wow. Uh, well, the role of youth in today's society is to save the world and to change the world because us old people screwed it up royally and didn't do enough. So unfortunately, a great obligation and responsibility has fallen on your shoulders. Uh, I'm speaking first and foremost around uh, the environment and uh, climate change, which is very important to address, but also the racial inequities and injustice and racial prejudice that is really eating away at the fabric of our society. Um, the divisions that um, divisions that divide us. It was kind of a lame sentence, but it's true. <laughs> the divisions that divide us uh, need to be tended to. And um, there's whatever area that one has an interest in as a young person, there it, it needs help. So we were talking a lot about service, but we need to uh, uh, really give back to the world. And that is going to be um, on the shoulders of youth. So like right now, as we're speaking, um, you know, dozens of people have died of this deep freeze temperatures in Texas. And this is part of of climate change because extreme weather events goes hand in hand with climate change. That's why they called it, they used to call it global warming and then they called it climate change because they saw that, it, oh, this is much more complicated than just the earth getting warmer. It's like extreme weather events. And Texas has never seen colds like this, single digit colds and yeah. temperatures in like the city of Houston. So a lot of people are suffering and who are suffering the most? Poor people. So. Um, we have to uh, shift to uh, a, a place of service and understand that the tests and difficulties that await humanity are very great and very grave. Exactly. And youth have an exuberance and a positivity and a can-do attitude um, that needs to be tapped into. You get old and you get kind of jaded. So to tap into that, that the power of youth to change the world. Thank you for that encouragement. It's time for us to put it into use and really come together to create the world we want to see. Um, so what advice do you have for youth who want to pursue a career in acting and entertainment? So the advice that I have is uh, if you want to go into the arts, um, study your craft. And that might sound obvious, but I think we live in a society that kind of views like, well, you either have it or you don't. And when I was 18, 
and started acting, I had a lot of talent, but I was pretty bad. And I needed training. So I went to the best training school I could go to in New York City and got acting training and studied for years. And even when I got out of college, like always taking workshops and classes and honing my craft and learning. And that's why I was able to be successful because I put in like years and years and years of work. So there's no substitute for hard work. My, one of my favorite phrases is the harder you work, the luckier you get. Um, and so no matter who you are pursuing a career in the media or the arts, you know, get training, find the best teachers. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to go to college, although I think college is a, is a great route to do. It doesn't necessarily mean that. But if you're not going to go to college, you have to make that up in some other way. Find someone to apprentice with, learn, study, be humble, you know, be in a humble posture of learning for many, many, many years, because it's going to take you 5, 10, 15 years before you have the skills to really be able to offer something. Wonderful advice. And before our episode ends, do you have any additional words of encouragement or advice you would like to share with our audience? Um, no, I think that you're a real inspiration, Yara. And <laughs> I love that you're, uh, you're 18 and you've got this podcast and it's got a real great focus and uh, you, you got, you're getting some great talent and guests. And uh, this is a real help because young people can listen to these episodes and be inspired and go, well, if Yara can do that, besides what they learn on the podcast, they can go, well, if Yara can do that, then I can do that. And she's kind of showed me the way. So keep going with your indomitable kind of positive spirit and can do attitude and love and service and uh, keep making great content. Thank you. I, I really, really, really appreciate it. And you guys heard it here. Listen to the episodes. But <laughs> Um, I wanted to say thank you very, very much, Mr. Wilson, for your insight and advice today. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. To learn more about Mr. Wilson and to check out his work, visit his Instagram at Rain Wilson and his Facebook at Rain Wilson. To learn more about Soul Pancake and to watch their videos, visit their website at https colon slash slash soulpancake.com and their YouTube channel under Soul Pancake. To learn more about Lide Haiti, the work they do, and how you can get involved, visit their website, lidahaiti.org, and all their social media links can also be found there too. Well, thank you again for your time today, Mr. Wilson. And as always, thank you all for listening. Be sure to subscribe, follow, and like the podcast on its various platforms, including YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts to be notified each time a new episode is posted. If you want to get the latest updates about the show, announcements, submit questions that you would like me to consider to talk about on the show, or join discussions related to the topics we discuss on the show, follow us on Instagram at spiritof.success, Facebook at spiritof.success9, and our new Facebook group under the Spirit of Success. Until next time, I'm your host, Yara, and don't forget to continue challenging yourself and working to make your spirit soar to new heights. Bye! So long! <laughs> <laughs>